Hello, and welcome back to another electronics lecture. In this lecture, we're going to continue discussing the component we've just introduced, which was the bipolar junction transistor, by discussing the behavior of the PN junctions that are inherent or built in to those bipolar junction transistors. Now, if you'll recall, when we first introduced the diode, we started off with a kind of detailed semiconductor description of the way the diodes PN junctions were going to behave and how those resulted in currents through the diode. Then we took a step back, we looked at the diode, and we decided that there were really two interesting kind of regions of operation that the diode might be in. One of them we called off, or not forward biased, and the other which we called on, which was forward biased. And so by breaking that diode down into those two regions, we were really able to kind of get a concrete view of how a given diode was going to behave at a given time without doing a whole lot of calculations, which was useful as it allowed us to design circuits using diodes without constantly checking our math throughout the whole design process. And then when we were done with the design, then we could compare our design to the less approximate Ebers-Mole model. We were able to design diode circuits, and then after those diode circuits were complete, we were able to really verify that our designs should work well, given our more detailed models of the diode. So what we'd like to do in this lecture is kind of perform a similar analysis. So in this lecture, we're going to introduce a kind of uh, more abstract model similar to our diode region model which is a common way of thinking about BJT behavior, bipolar junction transistor behavior, which we'll find is helpful when composing significant bipolar junction transistor circuits. So we'll find that these models allow us to more easily design bipolar junction transistor circuits. And so just like we did with our diode analysis, we're going to gain insight into an approximate BJT behavior by analyzing the PN junctions within the BJT and viewing each of those junctions as either forward biased or on or not yet forward biased and off. So given this model there's really three states of interest. The first state is simply the state in which there are zero junctions forward biased And as you might imagine, the two additional ones are when we have one and then two junctions forward biased. And we'll find that in conjunction with the transistor model we discussed in detail in the last lecture, these three states really give us a good insight as to how the BJT is operating. Our first region of interest occurs when neither of the two PN junctions contained inside that bipolar junction transistor are forward biased. So we have zero forward biased junctions. And in this case, we know that we have two reverse biased junctions, which are going to have nice, thick, high impedance depletion regions. And so we know that no significant current is going to flow through those big, thick depletion regions. And so no significant current should flow in or out of any terminal of this transistor. So we're not going to expect any significant current flowing into the collector, the base, or out of the emitter. And so we call this state, in which no significant amount of current is flowing through any terminal, cutoff mode. We say that the transistor is cut off and no significant amount of current flows. We could actually pretty easily imagine a situation in which this cutoff mode might occur so if we kind of take our simple diode approximations and apply them to the two junctions that are built into this bipolar junction transistor, we can see that approximately, again using our uh, simple diode approximations, we would expect the base emitter junction to be reverse biased or not to be forward biased when the voltage from the base to the emitter, which I'll write as VBE, is less than the forward voltage of that base emitter junction. And again, for a more accurate view, instead of taking this approximation, we would plug um, the actual base emitter voltage into Ebers mole. But if we just want to know simply whether this base emitter junction is going to allow any significant amount of current to flow, 
We can simply treat it as we've been treating our diodes and assume that if the voltage from base to emitter is less than the forward voltage of that PN junction, then no significant amount of current flows. And we can do the same thing for the base collector junction. We know that if the base collector junction, which remember goes from that base terminal to the collector terminal here at the top, we know that if that junction is reverse biased, that implies that the voltage from the base to the collector is less than the forward voltage of the base collector junction. So when these two conditions are met, we can very easily approximate this BJT's behavior by saying the BJT is in cutoff. And so we expect no significant amount of current to flow in or out of any of these terminals. Our next mode of interest occurs when one of the two junctions is forward biased. So here we have one forward biased junction. And in this case, we know the current flows through both of those junctions as we spent the time quantifying in the previous lecture. So here, again, I've drawn the structure of an NPN transistor. Now one of our two junction has contracted as it's gone into forward bias, and we know that we're going to get some significant current from the base terminal to the emitter. And remember, this is a conventional current, and we know also that based on the semiconductor effects we were describing in the previous lecture, that that uh, base emitter current is going to cause a proportionally larger current to flow from the collector to the emitter. And we discussed in the previous lecture how we could describe those using the basic Ebers-Mole model, which quantified the total amount of current coming out of the emitter, and essentially had the same form as the diode form of the Ebers-Mole equation. So the Ebers-Mole equation right here tells us essentially the same thing it did when we were looking at just one PN junction. And we know that the ratio of the base current to the collector current is going to be given by our current gain, or beta, sometimes called HFE, which is just the ratio of the collector current to the base current. So effectively, when we know that only one of these junctions is forward biased, all the behaviors we saw in the previous lecture are going to occur. And typically, we'd be forward biasing the base emitter junction and reverse biasing, which I'll use gray for here, the base collector junction. So that would actually occur when the voltage from the base to the emitter is now greater than that forward voltage of the base emitter junction, but the voltage from the base to the collector is still less than the forward voltage for the base collector junction. And we can imagine a situation pretty easily in which that might occur. For example, if my collector was at 10 volts, my base was at 1 volt, and my emitter was sitting down at our reference ground. All of these respect, with respect to some reference ground. So in this case, I know that the base emitter voltage is greater than my forward voltage. And here we know that the base collector junction, which is effectively reverse biased by 9 volts, is sitting there well in its reverse bias state. And so in this case, we call this the active region because all the interesting phenomena that we discussed in that previous lecture and which we've quantized in the form of these two equations actually hold true. And as we design analog circuits, quite a few of our designs are heavily going to rely on the behavior of the transistor while it's inside this active mode. And the final of our three modes of interest occurs when both of the two junctions contained in that bipolar junction transistor are forward biased. This is the case where we have two forward biased junctions. And so as those two junctions start to turn on, we enter a third mode, which is called saturation mode. And so in this case, both of these junctions are on, and we have the least possible impedance from the collector of that transistor to its emitter. So here in the NPN transistor I've drawn, I know that the least possible impedance is going to appear between my collector and my emitter, and thus 
the voltage between the collector and the emitter is going to reach its lowest state. And we can actually find information about this parameter on most transistor data sheets. Most transistor data sheets will tell you what the lowest possible value of the voltage from the collector to the emitter is, which they'll call the voltage collector to emitter in saturation, or it's written here VCE sat. And this tends to be somewhere around the ballpark uh, of 0 0.2 volts, 200 millivolts or lower, depending on the transistor. Now a general recipe for this to occur requires both of those two junctions to be forward biased. So you know that the voltage across this base emitter junction has to be greater than the forward voltage of that base emitter junction and the voltage across that base collector junction has to be greater than the forward voltage of the base collector junction. Now, in this case, it's very important to note that we are making an approximation still, but as we enter this case, as we get closer and closer to that forward voltage of that base collector junction, as that base collector junction starts becoming more and more forward biased, we know that this depletion region is going to shrink more and more. And as that depletion region really shrinks, the impedance of this transistor drops lower and lower. And when it finally reaches its lowest possible value, we say that this transistor has saturated, which means that its impedance cannot possibly get lower. And in this case, interestingly enough, we don't just have current flowing from the base to the emitter, and we also have current flowing from the base to the collector. Now, since the impedance from the collector to the emitter is going to be very, very low here, and since usually the emitter is at our lowest potential, on these NPN transistors, usually that current will flow back down to the emitter anyway. Now we're going to talk about saturation in more detail in the coming lectures when we actually have circuits that can realistically saturate. And as we do that, we'll begin to analyze how this whole saturation phenomena really starts to affect our circuit. But one of the properties of a transistor in saturation that I do want to emphasize is that once this transistor becomes saturated and we start turning on that base collector junction, we'll reach a point where the voltage between the collector and emitter of that transistor can be approximated using that statistic that we obtained from the transistor's data sheet or from the transistor's manufacturer, which we called the voltage from collector to emitter during saturation or in saturation. One additional interesting ramification of that saturation state is that as we start pulling some of that current from the base into the collector, we're decreasing the overall amount of base emitter current. So some of the current that would normally be entering the base and passing through directly to the emitter now passes through the collector instead. And what this actually results in is that that, sim that beta value that we were saying gave us an approximation of the ratio of our collector value to our base value is going to change. Well, actually, because some of the current that would normally be flowing from the base to the emitter and thus resulting in additional collector current is now instead flowing from the base to the collector and then eventually to the emitter, we see less overall base emitter current. And because it's effectively that base emitter current that causes our collector current, what we find is that increasing our base current does not as significantly increase our collector current. And what that looks like to us is that in saturation, we start getting less current gain. Now, we'll see how we can actually use this whole saturation state to our advantage as we move further through these lectures. But for now, it's enough to know that once we reach that saturation state, the impedance from the collector to the emitter reaches its lowest possible state. The voltage from the collector to emitter approaches that saturation collector emitter voltage as specified on the device's data sheet. And we can expect as much current gain as we would be able to in the act states. So you'll notice that as we performed our modal analyses, we actually analyzed each of the three modes that our bipolar junction transistors could be in. We actually only cared about the number of PN junctions that were forward biased. That makes sense because 
our BJTs have roughly symmetrical compositions. So in terms of type of semiconductor, we know that our semiconductors are composed of alternating layers N and then P and then N, or P and then N and then P kinds of materials. And that means that the analyses we performed will work no matter which junctions are forward biased. So theoretically, if we were to use this transistor in the opposite way as to its typical intended use, so let me try to draw a transistor upside down here. So theoretically, if I had the emitter section of that transistor pointing up and the collector section pointing down on an NPN, and I still applied voltages in about the same general regions, this analysis would still hold. I'd still be able to perform the same analysis just by thinking about how the two PN junctions inside that transistor were going to behave. But there's one big caveat here, one big but, and that's that we've optimized our BJTs for use in a single direction. They are optimized for use with the base emitter junction, forward biased, in the active mode, and the collector base junction, reverse biased, in the active mode. We could actually flip this. We could create a circuit in which the base emitter junction was reverse biased, and the base collector junction, or collector base junction, was forward biased. It would still work in the same way as a bipolar junction transistor, but it would be an inoptimal bipolar junction transistor. So for example, while we can expect gains in a typical bipolar junction transistor to be somewhere around 100 for a non-powered transistor, we can only expect the gains for a reversed BJT to be in the single digits, so three or five would be typical values for current gain in those reverse active transistors. So typically we'll prefer to use transistors in the forward region almost exclusively. So I've yet to see a reverse active uh, bipolar junction transistor in any kind of common use. So hopefully by thinking about each of these three modes, you'll be able to understand the way a bipolar junction transistor works a little better. Now, if all of this seems like it's kind of an information overload, that's okay. This information is intended to kind of provide a very simple overview of how we might think of a BJT. But we're actually not going to use all of this all at once as we construct our designs. So what we're going to do from here is start using bipolar junction transistors and circuits and start analyzing those bipolar junction transistors. And as we do that, you'll really be able to get a feel for how these transistors work. So if all of this seems overwhelming now, we're going to find that as we move forward and we start really designing circuits, you'll have a better and better appreciation for how the internals of these circuits work and you'll really start being able to make very good predictions as to bipolar junction transistor behavior.